want to welcome you to CMDA Matters today and a little unusual setting because I'm in sunny Southern California with someone who has become a friend and someone that I admire over the last couple of years and that is Jennifer Zamora. Uh, she lives here in Southern California. She is a professor of practice and director of didactic education at the University of Laverne, Master of Science program for Physician Assistants training, PA training, and uh, she's been very involved in actually building different PA programs because when I first met you, Jen, I think you were actually faculty member here uh, where we're seated at California Baptist University, weren't you? Yes, I was, and a founding faculty member of that PA program. And when, when did you launch the program here at this on this beautiful campus? It was 2015-2016 is when we got accreditation going and were able to bring in our first cohort. Well, it's a beautiful campus. We were here a couple of years ago for the Remedy Healing for the Nations Conference. The idea was, you know, there's this big medical missions conference every year in Louisville, but how many people from the West Coast really, we don't think that that many people are able to come to Louisville, Kentucky, and so launched this with the help of our Western Region Director, Michael McLaughlin. Let me just share a few other things with our listeners, Jen. Jen has been teaching. She has a real penchant for teaching and for clinical didactics with a focus on pediatric and infectious disease, uh, assisting PA uh, students in developing their clinical skills. As we said, she was a founding faculty member here at California Baptist University, which for our listeners who are not familiar, it's in Riverside, California, a burb. You call it a burb of Los Angeles? Yeah, a suburb. Okay. Also has been a guest lecturer at the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine. I um, I, am actually uh, subscribed to um, Audio Digest Surgery, and a lot of lectures come out of that series for our own CME from Keck School of Medicine. So a well-known school where you've had... um, Definitely. Also co-director and clinical faculty of UC Riverside School of Medicine. And... Recently, Jen, we were both attending a conference back just last month up the coast at Cannon Beach, an annual conference that our Western Region Director Mike McLaughlin puts on there. And we got a unique 90-minute ride together from Portland out to the beach. Yes, that was a divine appointment. (laughs) I literally texted Pastor Michael McLaughlin and said, hey, do you know of any uh, ride shares going out of the airport? Because I hadn't booked anything That trip was a last minute step of faith. And he said, what time are you coming in? I'll be by to pick you up. And then you were in the passenger seat. (laughs) And then all the way out to Cannon Beach, got to hear your testimony and the way God was using you and your family. And uh, I think you'll you'll remember, I said, wow, you have an incredible husband. And he was here yesterday at my last workshop. Very good. And um, I, you know, had my dad come because he's a prayer warrior for our outreach. And he'll come pray over patients and and bring his Bible and share scripture with them. And my little 10-year-old daughter joined them. So they were actually here. (laughs) Well, I got to hear and was reminded that you wrote the cover article for our winter CMDA Today, our quarterly publication from CMDA, that you wrote the cover article, and that article was entitled Street Medicine, Running a Free Clinic in the Era of COVID. And you had your own personal experience with COVID, didn't you, Jen? Yes, and what was scary is that we were the first of anybody that we knew of our friends, family, to have gotten COVID. And we didn't even know it was circulating in southern california yet i i suspected it did northern california had some cases already but yeah i was at kaiser la off sunset boulevard march 18th i guess right yeah very busy hospital i was there for my grandma who had heart surgery and little did i know i picked up the virus there and the reason why i know i picked it up there is because my sister and i were only around each other at that hospital Mm -hmm. for 12 hours and so um She flew home to Texas the next morning. I dropped her off at LAX. She got sick within two days. I was really sick within two days. And sure enough, we both tested positive for COVID. And it was not Omicron version. This was like early on. (laughs) No, the (laughs) original, the original virus, yeah. And again, it was really scary and unknown because I had also been teaching um, at the paramedic program. So they were talking about how to um, interact with potential patients that may have this. And we were literally running simulations about two weeks prior to this. So I was, I didn't want to expose anybody. I just, you know, I was a little nervous, but 
I also felt like this is in God's hands, you know, and I had already spread it to my family, so I felt really bad about that. But our family had the full spectrum, so I was the worst because I have a pre-existing heart condition. My husband was pretty sick for 10 days, and he's a very healthy guy, very fit. Um, My teenager had it for three days, but just like cold-like symptoms. And then my 10-year-old, who was nine at the time, tested positive, but she never showed a symptom. Wow. So we had the full spectrum. The full spectrum. And, yeah. you know, your pre-existing heart condition must not be a wimpy one because you had, in your story you tell in our magazine, a defibrillator. And you, yes. st- you, st- you described sitting at your bedside hoping that your husband or your daughter would be able to defibrillate. You felt so sick, you're like, maybe this is it. Maybe yeah, I'm going I to Yeah, I just heaven. said, open this up, push this button, it'll talk to you. <laughs> you know, follow the sticky pads where to place them, and it'll tell you if you need to push the button while you're calling 911. And that's if I if I went unconscious, you know, and I, I said, if, I, if I'm not responding, I'm looking a little cyanotic, a little blue, you know, then do this while you're calling 911. Well, I didn't know till later, like, that really freaked them out. But I just wanted to be safe and prepared, you know, because a lot of people don't know what to do when something like that happens. So I'm all about training and teaching, and even if it's my own family. So that training and teaching extends to a clinic that's, I believe, here in Riverside, isn't it? Remind me the name of the clinic. Inland Vineyard Medical Mission and Free Clinic is actually based, it's in the Inland Empire, but the neighboring city is Corona. And so that's kind of our home base. It's a church that I've been attending since I was 17 years old. Now I'm 41. And I just grew really close to the youth pastor at the time, who's now the senior pastor. So we've done a lot of outreaches and different things together. But once I became a PA student, I was tossing around ideas of a free clinic. So Mm. me and some pre-med students actually started very small services. I'm reminded of that verse in Zechariah where the Lord does not despise small beginnings, Mm. but he loves to see the work begin. And that's how I felt. Like it was small. We just did screenings for blood pressure and blood sugar education. I sat down with a lawyer. We drafted up a um, liability release form. And he said we're covered under the Good Samaritan law as students. So it was just young students what year was starting that? that. When did you launch? This was 2008. Okay. So 14 years later, or maybe 13, the beginning of COVID, and you and the students, those who were helping you in this clinic, and now it's you know, obviously become very mature. How many patients would you see and how often? So it depends on the outreach. Um, when we go into downtown, we're right next to a shelter called Path of Life Shelter. And then that's county ran. And then right next to it, literally across the parking lot, is a bunch of tiny little white houses. They call them the homeless pods. And those are city ran. So there used to be a huge encampment off that industrial street. Well, they were trying to clean it up because of all the complaints from the businesses. So they moved a lot of the homeless into these pods. We didn't want to get into turf battles between county and city. So we literally set up on the public sidewalk (laughs) outside from both and so we help both populations so that's probably our busiest we'll get between 15 to 20 sometimes up to 25 patients um, where we come and we regularly bring them their blood pressure medicine we have one guy he counts on us for his allergy medicine and he puts his request in for these special allergy drops Zatador is great even though it's over the counter a lot of them can't afford these simple things and it could really affect their you know activities of daily living some of these conditions that they're dealing with there's others that are new to us so we have the maintenance ones some of the newer ones will come with like cellulitis or an abscess that needs to be drained we'll literally on the sidewalk set up kind of the most sterile field we can and do ingrown toenail removals we do a lot of procedures out there and When it's like flu vaccine time, we're able to work with UCR School of Medicine and get vaccines over to them. So it's been really great. When we go into the riverbeds, the patients vary. There's only probably maybe three to five medically, but a lot of them count on us to bring them food and clothing. And so uh, we work with the church who has a food distribution center. But again, it started off really small. It's just a little church pantry. But over the years, as the medical ministry's grown, so has the food ministry. And then in actual corona at the church location, it could be anywhere from, again, five patients up to 15 on a Saturday morning. So let's talk about, go back to the 2020, COVID hit. And as you talk about in the article that you wrote for the, for the magazine, 
You're concerned. I mean, you're providing food, uh, basic care for folks, many of whom live on the streets or homeless. So how did you account for the fear and the risk of COVID spread? You, I think you did some things that were rather innovative. Yes, that was difficult <laughs> because when I was laying sick in bed, I really had to count on which volunteers were able to you know, um, overcome their fears and get out there still. We did lose quite a few volunteers because they didn't want, even though they had a heart and passion to help, they didn't want to expose maybe an elderly relative at home. But what was neat is some of them continued to work behind the scenes. So maybe they would scribe from home um, notes that were done in the field. Sometimes we can't always get a Wi-Fi signal. And so we'll go, we'll switch back to paper, but then that has to be scribed back into the electronic medical record system. So they may help that way. And one of the best helps that I've ever gotten was this one student who didn't want to expose his high risk mother to COVID or his grandmother sat and wrote a grant application and he got us this $20,000 grant. (laughs) So we've been functioning off of donations and us pulling our money together for offerings beyond the tithe. And once he got that, that's how the food pantry was able to expand and our medical missions and pop-up clinics. So we get these easy ups that can actually have like walls to create like a little private setting for patients kind of in the middle of nowhere. We were able to purchase a generator. So when we'd go out to help migrant patients, we often have to set up when they're done for the day coming out of the fields from picking. So it's usually sunset. We'd literally have like lights on our head, little lights set up, but it was really hard to see. And you know, the generator was gonna allow us to have more power. So this grant really has blessed us. And he just being from home, was able to still bless. So I was relying on the volunteers that can get out there and still kind of teleport or telemed the the patients to me while I'm like still recovering and I could see them electronically. And what made me brave to do that is I remember seeing that laws were gonna be waived and that telemedicine was gonna be embraced more and we weren't gonna be held to these like scary standards that people think of in this COVID pandemic. And so I hope the way we've developed telemedicine can continue for those patients that want to use it. But I also hope that physicians and and clinicians, PAs and Ps will also be brave and reopen their offices and allow people back in. Has that happened? Is that happening now in early 2022? I am shocked. Things were seeming to get back to normal, but then when the Omicron variant just hit recently, our office had to reclose because all the medical assistants got that strain. My physician that I work with um, was so ill, he ended up hospitalized. So the clinic shut down for a period of time. And then other clinics and other friends that call me to listen to them, they may be having an asthma flare, they may have swollen tonsils, and so they're not getting a lot of help from telemed at times. So I'll step in and do home visits and help them, but they're constantly told, oh, you probably have the Omicron COVID go get tested, go get tested. And I get that's appropriate in some settings, but not for others that may have been vaccinated or maybe they recently got over COVID and they really have an asthma flare. <laughs> they need their lungs listened to, you know? So it's, it's hard. I, I feel like I'm trying to be kind of the glue with um, the medical systems that's around me. And if a patient isn't getting what they need, then I'll just step in to take care of it. Now, Jen, I remember from our conversation out to Cannon Beach that God has called you, inspired you, enabled you to do more than what we've been talking about in terms of street medicine. You've been involved in other ministries, cross-cultural ministries. Tell our listeners just a little bit about all that God's got you involved in. Yeah, well, currently, um, my husband and I have been part of a marriage ministry, so we help run marriage retreats a couple times a year. I do think it's important to keep your relationship with your spouse strong, especially those of us in medicine that are so pulled in so many directions. I mean, we were trying to celebrate our 20-year wedding anniversary in Kauai about two weeks ago, and I'm getting called and texts left and right, you know, from patients or from friends that need help that can't get the help they need. And my husband's so sweet. We're literally trying to look over Waimea Canyon, which is like their Grand Canyon, a mini version of it. And he's like, I know you need to help them do what you got to do, you know, or do what you're called to do. 
So I step away for a few minutes, take care of something, or that night, like when we've already settled for the day, I open up my computer, type out a prescription, get the EMR updated for something. And so I've just learned to live my calling and weave it in and out through my life, Mm -hmm. but it didn't stop or affect what we had to do. You know, there's times I'm like, oh, I can't get a cell signal. I'm just going to enjoy this moment and I'll deal with that later. But another thing when you say cross-cultural that comes to mind is when you're dating somebody, you really should get on the same page with them. Because I remember in a conversation to my husband at the time when we were friends and it was advancing into boyfriend, girlfriend, I said, listen, I know God called me into medicine and I know he's called me into foreign missions and I'm going to go to Africa one day. (laughs) I said, you have to be okay with those things or we can't go any further. Uh And he said, uh... Uh, he kind of hesitated and he's like, no, I support all of that. And I'll even go with you on your first trip. If anybody knows my husband, they know he's a homebody. He does not like to travel and he gets anxiety on airplanes. Wow. This so is that love. Was, this is love. Yes. That was a huge step of faith. We were already parents of a two-year-old by the time we made it to Uganda. And we came home and he said that was one of the best experiences of my life. He rededicated his life to the Lord and got baptized in a pool next to the Nile River <laughs> by the pastor on the trip. Uh-huh. And it was just such a good spiritual journey. I mean, I'm doing medicine out of mud huts, you know, with a medical team. And he's outside trying to keep the kids in the line entertained, um, teaching them American football, which later we're like, they're so smart. They're like, why do you call it football if you mostly use your hands? Because <laughs> obviously worldwide, they're used to football being soccer. <laughs> But they were excited to learn a new game, and he helped with different puppet shows. And so it was just really neat to do that together as like a solid foundation. But on the plane ride home, he kind of patted my arm, and he said, that was a great experience, and I'm glad I did it, but I don't think I'll be going out again. (laughs) He's like, so you do what you need to do or what God's calling you to do, and I'll be supportive from home. So after that, I've done trips into Haiti after the earthquakes to help with the populations that were dealing with typhoid and cholera and tuberculosis outbreaks. Um, I've gone into Mexico quite a few times. And then the big island, sadly, that trip has been canceled twice now due to COVID and all the restrictions on the Hawaiian Islands. But we originally were going to start working with the population that was affected by the lava where it destroyed over 700 homes. It really messed up a lot of communities in like the Puna area, which is near Hilo. And I work with a marriage family therapist who said, yeah, we need a lot more help in these communities. You know, can you come out and help? So yeah, just trying to still make that happen, work with the University of Hilo students if I can. I would love to go in and train that university and those students how to help their community you know, so they're not just waiting on me to come back every year. So I would love to go and I empower. So even with medical student groups, there's times I'll go out with the Pacific Island Asian um, groups and I'm like, oh, you guys don't have a glucometer. You guys don't have this equipment. And then I like donate them stuff. So then they can continue up with that. And I don't have to always be the one to bring it <laughs> or be present. So I'm I'm very much about paying it forward and creating models that are self-sustaining. How did you first get involved with CMDA? How how were you made aware of it? And then how have you engaged with CMDA as a PA? Because I'm... I'm, I'm going to take you in a direction to, to woo some of our listeners to get their PAs involved in CMDA. Yes. Okay. I'm really glad you asked this because I, I need to give this doctor credit. So it's my first week at USC and I'm looking at all these clubs and I see all the religion clubs and I'm like, wow, there's Jewish clubs, there's Wiccan clubs, like, okay. And I'm looking for the Christian ones. And then I noticed the Christian one was only meeting on main campus, but then I found out the med students had their version of it but it was on the health science campus well as the PA program we were on the Alhambra campus so it's different it's like a 20 minute drive and I'm like what so I talked to the director of our program and I'm like was there anything that used to happen in a Christian based here on this campus and she she introduced me to this one student where he said yeah we would get together sometimes and read the bible and you know this person would play the guitar and we'd sing a song or two But nobody had been doing that. They were seniors, so they were in their third year, but I was in my first year. Mm -hmm. So they're ready to graduate and move on. So I'm like, gosh, I have to kind of start things over. So I totally took the leap of faith and was so scared because I know once you're outed as a Christian, sometimes you're not treated well. But I made flyers, put them in all my classmates' box and said, 
hey, do you want to join me for a Bible study? Let's meet on this lunch break this day in this location. So sitting there alone was so nerve-wracking to see if anybody would show up. So the first day, two girls showed up. And then the next time, I had three show up. Well, I had heard Dr. Paul Holton. He's an amazing infectious disease um, doctor. He taught us a lot of our infectious disease. He's the one that I've worked with really closely in education as well, because he's actually come and been a guest speaker for me at Cal Baptist. I heard he's a Christian, and I'm like, what are the chances he'd come give his testimony before a lecture or speak at our group? And that just blew the doors open. So everybody who heard that he was going to be speaking at our group, we had like 25 out of 50, like half of our class come. He said, don't tell anybody, but I think now I can give him the credit. It's been so many years later. He slips me $200 and says, students love food. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. If you supply some food, more people, you know, will come to your thing. So I'm like, sweet. One day we did like pickup sticks. Another day we did Subway sandwiches. And that was true. Whenever we advertised free food, we'd have bigger turnouts. But he shared his amazing testimony of how he balanced his spiritual life with being a busy doctor, how there was times he was stuck at the hospital but wanted to be at church with his wife and i just loved hearing like that dynamic because nobody was really talking about the spiritual side and how to keep your spiritual side up and so we gave him this opportunity to do that well it was after he guest spoke and he kind of leaned over to me and he was like you should join us one time on our campus so i did and he also said your leaders here at this group should go to cmda and that's when i first heard Christian Medical Dental Association. And so I've thrown his name around a few times and people knew who he was, but it's because of that doctor and sowing that seed and coming to speak to our little PA group, you know, that like a few of the leaders went with me. We went to one of the conferences you guys were having in Pasadena. I took my husband with me. I take him a lot of places. (laughs) He'll still refer back to the main speaker first session where he was saying, you know, too much who's been given, much, much expected, expected yes. yes and and also though prioritizing you know prioritizing god and your family you know and your calling and so sometimes if i'm like i filled up too much on my plate or i'm racing around here and there he's like don't forget you know like cmda <laughs> he'll bring it up like prioritize like what do you need to get off your plate now what do you need to hand off to other people so i feel like god really put him in my life to like ground me and like to get me to relax but also he says vice versa like I lit a fire in him to finish his education to finish his bachelor's and eventually he finished his master's and so I think that God definitely molds different people to fit and complement each other well yes and so he's done that with us I get asked quite frequently you know why would a PA want to become a member of this organization and one of the recent uh, stories that I tell them is a PA who was booted because she refused to sign a piece of paper that said I will use whatever pronouns that a patient asked me to use and I will refer for even for children uh, gender transition drugs and or surgeries and she refused to sign that she was immediately booted and so CMDA came along and we have connected her uh, with all kinds of support including legal support in in her situation that is becoming I mean physicians PAs nurse practitioners all facing those sorts of dilemmas in which they need help what else would you say to someone uh, who says why Jen should I get involved with CMDA as a PA I felt just completely supported. I feel, I literally said it three times yesterday, like it just feels like being around family Mm. here. And even if you're not called into foreign medical missions, I was telling my husband, like, you're a missionary, you know, in your school district. He works at a public school institution. And again, he's around all these medical people coming yesterday, but he gets so excited. And and I got to kind of say that, hey, he does a good news club. And he's seen over 300 kids in the public school system dedicate their lives to the Lord. And literally um, this past Thursday, he's like, yeah, and I had another one give their life to Jesus just on Thursday. So him and two other Christian teachers develop the Good News Club and they go in for special trainings, but they have it every week. And we have to rally up people to know that wherever God has placed them, that is their mission field at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, I'm impressed. Like, 
yes, I love Uganda. I'd love to go back. But the fact that you spent 20 years, I believe, in Kenya. Yes, yes. Well, I only had a layover in Nairobi <laughs> on my way to Entebbe, Uganda. And so I've always wanted to see more of Kenya. And I'm like, that always fascinates me. But God doesn't always call right. all of us That's to right. that type of missions. But what I've learned, and I thought this sitting in Uganda, like, what can I do for my community? What can I do in the United States that I don't have to fly around the world to do? You know, what can I do for the patients that are in need? And everybody thinks because, oh, you live in a rich country, you know, and we hear that in other countries, that we have no problems, that we're all rich. And no, like even being in Haiti and speaking at a women's conference between all the medical days we were doing, I was like, listen, I've been homeless before as a teenager when my mom died young, my dad lost everything. I said I had to grow up really fast and take care of my younger sisters and it was a struggle. I had a stepmom who's very abusive and um, she abused drugs and alcohol and their eyes were just huge. They didn't think that we can have these kinds of problems, you know, or that somebody could be homeless in the United States. Um, wow, has that changed? Yeah. Exactly. And now we're seeing more and more people can't afford rent, especially in places like San Diego, San Francisco, you know, these these cities where the rent just keeps going up. It's, it's shoving a lot of people out into the streets. And so my goal is to be able to collaborate and work with more social workers, because what I was sharing in the workshop yesterday, yes, I can drain this abscess. I can put this patient on Keflex and give it to them not hope they're going to fill it by handing them a prescription and then we could give them a box of food and give them warm clothing but i hate leaving them right there on the side of the riverbank you know like i want to do more to connect them with this, with social services for the, social for the... services and mental health services mm -hmm. we really really need more people in, in the mental health field because some of it yes they were working paycheck to paycheck and one medical thing they went bankrupt or we've heard a lot of sad stories where these are hardworking people or some of them that are living out of their cars have multiple jobs you know they're some of the hardest workers we've seen they just can't afford rent so what other things can we do to help that that's my next big adventure is to embark on more social justice projects yeah well, Jen, thank you for joining me this morning for this conversation and for contributing to Remedy, sharing with participants who came to your breakout session. Our motto is changing hearts in healthcare, and you've taken the bull by the horns in PA school and started a group there. Who, who knows what God is doing in the lives of all your fellow, your peers who were with you at that time, and then those you're reaching on a weekly basis in your clinic and in your own practice. I just, I'm amazed at how you're fitting all of this in. But you're educating, encouraging, and equipping Christian healthcare professionals to glorify God. So you are the epitome of accomplishing what CMD is all about. So thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm very honored to be on this podcast and to have been asked to write that article that I did. Um, and I'm just always appreciative. And you guys have a special place in my heart always. Thank you. Thank you. What an incredible story of the leap of faith that Jennifer and her fellow students took more than a dozen years ago to start a free clinic for the underserved in their community. It truly was a small beginning, as she mentioned, and it's inspirational to see how it's grown and how they've partnered with the local church to expand and offer medicine, food, and, and more to that homeless community. If you want to read more about the work that Jennifer is doing with students out there in California, be sure to check out her article that was in the winter 2021 edition of CMDA Today, our quarterly magazine. You can find that article, go to cmda.org slash cmda today. We know that Jennifer is one among many, uh, I'll call them giants within the healthcare profession who are following God's call wherever that leads them. Do you want to share your story with us? Maybe it's similar to Jennifer's. Then email communications at cmda.org or visit cmda.org slash cmda today to learn more about how you can submit an article to our magazine, CMDA Today. During my conversation with Jen today, I jotted down several notes of things that she mentioned that I specifically wanted to put on your radar. First is our new Fellowship Plus program, which is based in both Detroit, Michigan, as well as Memphis, Tennessee. 
As a ministry of CMDA, Fellowship Plus is a 21-month preparation for Christian disciples committed to domestic or international healthcare service. It is an opportunity to grow deeper in intimacy with God while living in community with like-minded missional disciples. If you'd like more information, you can go to fellowshipplusplus.org. Next, if you are a physician assistant, just like Jennifer, or you know a physician assistant who might benefit, I encourage you to check out the Fellowship of Christian Physician Assistants, otherwise known around here as FCPA. As a specialty section of CMDA, FCPA focuses on providing a support network for the spiritual, professional, and personal lives of our PA members. They also equip and they encourage members to share their faith in all aspects of their lives and to glorify God in service to others. You can get involved. Just visit cmda.org FCPA. Just like I shared in last week's episode, FCPA is just one of many groups on CMDA's growing list of our specialty sections. These sections are organized by volunteer members of CMDA, and they can give you the opportunity to equip, network, and fellowship with colleagues in your specific healthcare specialty. If you want to find a section for your specialty, visit cmda.org slash specialty sections. Before we finish out today's announcements, I want to take a break for a short Stewardship Matters segment with our Vice President of Stewardship, George Courtney, and Associate Director, Paul Montgomery, from CMDA's Stewardship Department. Thank you for joining us today for Stewardship Matters. I'm George Courtney, Vice President of Stewardship and Legacy Giving. Today, Paul Montgomery, Senior Director of Stewardship and Legacy Giving, joins me to share some important thoughts about reviewing and updating our wills and estate plans and charitable bequests. Thank you, George. I'm happy to be here with you today. It's great to have you, Paul. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon gives us some great wisdom. He says this, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Paul, I know this whole idea of taking time to review our estate plan especially resonates with you right now. Back in November, we celebrated the birth of your first granddaughter and your third grandchild with you and Cherry. Congratulations. Thanks, George, and what a blessing she is, and also our two grandsons. And you're right. This is a time when we're reviewing and thinking about how our estate plan may need to be updated to fully reflect our goals. So the birth or adoption of a child or grandchild is an excellent trigger that should remind us it's time to review our estate plan. What other triggers are there that we should be aware of? Illnesses or disability of a spouse, acquiring or purchasing property. The other thing that is a trigger, has there been a recent increase or decrease in the stock market? And yes, we have experienced that this year uh, and it's changed our assets such that we always have to go back and reassess where we are, our investment changes. Those are things that I think come to mind. Here at CMDA, Paul, it's been our goal to help equip our members and our donors to be good stewards, that of being a manager of what God has entrusted to them. What resources do we have available for our listeners today if they are looking for help in reviewing their estate plan? George, we are blessed to have several partners that work well with us. Recently, we added about a year ago the Barnabas Foundation to our portfolio of offerings to our members. And as you're aware, the Barmers Foundation has helped thousands of generous Christians to accomplish their tax-wise initiatives and also the generosity plans that they have. And if anyone wants to know more about Barnabas or what they have offering for us, they can reach us here at 888-230-2637 or email us at stewardship at cmda.org. Paul, this has been very helpful. Here at the beginning of the year, 
whenever we're gathering all those tax receipts, thinking about April coming and filing our taxes, reviewing our financial plans, to also know that it's a priority to review our estate plan. Thank you for those helpful tips, thinking through any transitions that may have happened over the past year or even in recent years since we reviewed our plan last. In the book of Proverbs, I want to leave you with one more nugget of wisdom from uh, Solomon. Thank you. He says this, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Until next time, remember, stewardship matters. Thanks so much, George and Paul, uh, for that helpful reminder and insight. Well, my conversation with Jen Zamora also reminded me of CMDA's Marriage Enrichment Ministry. This ministry of CMDA provides four to six conferences every year known as Marriage Enrichment Weekends to provide healthcare couples with an opportunity to nurture and grow in their marital relationships. These weekends offer a comfortable get away from it all setting, allowing couples to communicate and experience a deeper appreciation for their marriage partnership. They have a threefold format that consists of brief information sessions, private time for couples to work on assignments that uh, taking a good look at their marital relationship, and then small group sessions to address the unique needs and stresses of our healthcare marriages. It's designed to help you have a healthier marriage and to improve your communication as well as develop spiritual intimacy, achieve balanced priorities, and rekindle romance. You know, my wife Pam and I were the beneficiaries of one of these weekends during my second year in general surgery practice in Michigan. The sharing times with the other couples there in Grand Rapids and the quiet times for one-on-one conversations with openness about where things stood for Pam and for me, they came at such a critical time for our young marriage and our young family. I highly recommend such an experience for you. If you'd like more information, visit cmda.org slash marriage. I was also struck in my conversation with Jen on how she comes alongside students and is training the next generation. Graduate school today is really a remarkable test of faith, especially with the increasing hostile environment for Christians on campuses all across our country. And that's why campus ministry is such an integral and core piece of who we are at CMDA, where students and residents are encouraged to live out the character of Christ on their campuses and as they continue on through their healthcare training. We reach all the way from the undergrad world through medical, nursing, and dental school, other trainings as well, and then into residency and fellowship. These student groups need healthcare professionals just like you to join them and be a mentor, be an encourager, and be an advisor to help students navigate those pressures and the stress of their training. If you'd like to get involved, I want to encourage you to visit cmda.org slash ccm to learn more about getting involved with our campus ministries. It's really hard to believe that this month, after so much has happened, is the two-year anniversary of COVID's abrupt interruption in all of our lives. Spending time with Jennifer out in California at the end of February reminded me how important it is to spend time with fellow believers in the family of God. And it makes me even more excited for our upcoming national convention. If you haven't registered yet, I encourage you to register now and reserve your spot. We will be together again. That's our theme in Indianapolis, Indiana on April 21st through the 24th, 2022, as we find renewal, refreshment, and revival together. Our speakers will include Dallas Jenkins, the creator and director of The Chosen TV series, Professor Carl Truman, who's the author of The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. We'll have Lila Rose, the founder and president of Live Action, as well as Dr. Daisy Dowell, who served as the board chair for Christian Community Health Fellowship. If you'd like more information and to register, just visit natcon, N-A-T-C-O-N, dot C-M-D-A dot org. Well, next week, we are putting together a conversation with the Chief Executive Officer of the International CMDA Association, 
Dr. Peter Saunders, uh, who's in the United Kingdom, as well as a missionary who's here in the U.S. for a short time from the Ukraine, who's been there for 17 years. And we're going to talk about what's happening right now in the Ukraine, the crisis, the war that's happening, the stress to Christians, including Christians in healthcare. You don't want to miss that conversation we're putting together for next week. As always, if you want to suggest a future guest for our podcast, you can email us at cmdamatters at cmda.org. And if you like our podcast, would you give us a five-star rating and share us on one of your favorite social media platforms today? I'm going to close our episode today with a verse that Jennifer shared with me during our conversation. And that verse is from Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Maybe the Lord is placing something on your heart today to take a step forward in getting involved with serving the underserved. Or maybe it's a small beginning and simply visiting our website to learn more about engaging with CMDA campus ministry. Whatever that looks like for you, my prayer for you, listener, is that you will take that small step forward, that you'll embrace the small beginning. Because our Lord, he'll rejoice in seeing the work begin in your life. And as you do so, you will bring the hope and healing of Christ to the world through your practice in healthcare today. That's what matters to CMDA, and CMDA matters more than ever. We'll see you next week, friends, Lord willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.